Hello, my name is Dr. Della Parker. I'm a naturopath and owner of Stellar Health and Wellness in Clackamas, Oregon. And today we're going to be talking about supporting the parasympathetic um, nervous system in order to manage stress. So first, um, we're going to be talking about different types of stress. So when we talk about stress, most people only think about emotional stress, um, you know, but our body perceives stress in many different kinds of ways. So let's start here with the obvious emotional stress. And okay, well, right now, the state of the world is kind of a big stressor. So there's that. Um, but relationships, that can obviously cause stress. Money is always a big stressor. Work, although I love my job, can definitely be a big source of stress. And then there's you. And that's a big one because we're talking about like past traumas, self-confidence, goals and aspirations you may be trying to meet, um, all of your internal thoughts and feelings. And those aren't necessarily easily accessible as practitioners. And so it's just something to be mindful of that might also be driving stress for patients. And then next here we have physical stress and that's characterized by anything that's affecting the phys physical body. So lack of sleep, subluxations, overtraining, undertraining, um, which under training, you know, sitting on the couch and being sedentary, people recognize that as a cause of stress, but sometimes the overtraining is something that is overlooked. So you want to make sure that your patients aren't going too hard at the gym, uh, especially if their nervous systems like are already frazzled and they're overstressed. So um, be mindful of that. And then uh, disease and injury, those are obvious other um, types of physical stressors. Chemical stressors are all the things that we're exposed to in the world. So we can talk about, you know, poor diet, all the pesticides, herbicides, and GMOs that are present in our food, drugs, and alcohol obviously provide chemical stressors that can affect the entire body. Um, the air that we breathe, so not just like air pollution, uh, but think about perfumes and those scented plug-in things things that people breathe in all the time. All those fragrances are chemical compounds that can disrupt hormones and create a lot of other stress on our systems. And then we have like beauty products, things that we put on our skin, lotions, makeups, kind of all the things that we lather on in the name of beauty, they all get absorbed through our skin and can be another contributor to the total stress load. Um, think about like over hand sanitizing with Purell and these other things that have a lot of chemicals. Um, just be conscious of all of those. And then lastly, thermal stress. So heat exhaustion and hypothermia, those are pretty obvious. Um, but also think about fast changes in temperature. So if it's, you know, 100 degree day outside in the summer and you're going back and forth to an air conditioned building, uh, you know, your body adapting to those fast changes in, in stress can, um, or fast changes in temperature can also be perceived as stress by your body. So this is an analogy that I use with my patients to help them better understand stress and how it's affecting them. Um, so this is my cup analogy. So we're all born with a stress handling cup. Some have a super big gulp size cup and some were born with a shot glass size cup. So when that cup fills up with, you know, the accumulation of all the stressors, it will overflow and you would get symptoms when it fills up. So a lot of people think about, you know, why can I get away with nothing and my husband can do all these things and he doesn't get any symptoms. So I just remind them that everybody has a different size stress handling cup. Um, so another, you know, example is uh, if you have a frazzled, stressed out mom, you know, come to your office and they want to do intermittent fasting. So I have to decide if I think that their cup is going to overflow from that additional stress or if it might actually benefit them. And so we talk about like growing the size of the patient's cup, you know, usually with adrenal support. Um, and so that has the ability to give her the ability to handle more stress. Um, we also want to identify stressors. They're going to be adding to her cup. So that we can eliminate them. So oftentimes these are like food intolerances or other lifestyle or behavior things they're doing to continually add to their stress. So by giving her a bigger cup that is less full of stress, 
you know, now she has a greater capacity to handle a therapy like intermittent fasting that may have previously spilled over into symptoms and maybe even put her to the next phase of adrenal fatigue. Uh, and we're going to talk about that now. So the general adaptation syndrome, uh, it's a measure of how our body adapts to stress. And this was created by Hans Selye back in the day, uh, back in like the 1950s, I believe. Um, and it isn't anything new, but with this syndrome, we see, you know, obviously we've got time here on the x-axis and resistance to stress on the y-axis. And the general idea is that acute stress lowers your res resistance, um, but as the stress becomes more chronic, your body can uh, put mechanisms in place to tolerate higher levels of stress. And, you know, this can... Uh, you know, it can come with some not so awesome, awesome symptoms along the way. Uh, but there also is a point when your body just can't tolerate stress anymore. And um, it's like your body's clocking out and it just leaves you with like all the damage that has been caused by that accumulating stress. So in the alarm phase, um, like I mentioned, uh, it's the first stage of that adrenal response. And so we see that there's really an increased production of epinephrine that stimulates that fight or flight response in our bodies. And that increases your blood sugar, your heart rate. Uh, it brings blood flow to your muscles and away from your digestive organs. Um, it's a normal response to an acute stressor. So like think about getting cut off in traffic. Um, that's a really good example. And our body should basically, after that spike of epinephrine or adrenaline, um, it should return to homeostasis, and that's when our parasympathetic nervous system should balance that out and everything should go back to normal. So unless that stress continues, um, you know, we would go back to normal. But if it does continue, that's when we might enter the resistance phase. Um, and this alarm phase and early resistance, uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on most today. So when that acute stressor is ongoing and when cortisol is released and cortisol helps your body, you know, adapt to that ongoing stress, the resistance phase, like I'd mentioned, that's when stress continues and your body is just like really trying to compensate. The parasympathetic nervous system is maybe attempting to return that acute stress to normal, um, but cortisol is also surging at this point. And so um, it's helping your body combat that stress and you increase your ability to adapt to that stress over time. But this is really where we see, um, we don't realize how much stress we're really experiencing because our body is handling it for us. And so we really see varied symptoms in this phase. And in the beginning, I usually see a lot more of that high anxiety. Um, and it's mostly because the epinephrine is still spiking with um, different stressors that come on. Um, but when a patient gets, you know, they have high anxiety and insomnia, but then when we get towards the end of the resistance phase or the second half of it, that's when we maybe see a little bit less anxiety, but a little bit more of that afternoon fatigue, brain fog, maybe weight gain just because of the chronic high levels of cortisol that they've been experiencing. Um, and we know that there are a lot of problems when we have chronic high le levels of cortisol um, besides the weight gain, you know, we get decreased immune function, increased risk of osteoporosis, high blood pressure, insomnia, um, and that cortisol curve manages production of a lot of other hormones. And when it's not having regular peaks and valleys like we would expect, we can see a lot of other health issues kind of form downstream. So after cortisol has really been high for so long, you know, our receptors can get used to it and then they just stop responding to the signaling. And that's when the HPA axis can really get out of whack and a patient can head toward the exhaustion phase. When your resistance uh, to stress kind of takes a dive, we head towards that exhaustion phase. And this is when your body really has just had enough of the stressor and it's kind of losing the ability to manage it. So in the exhaustion phase, that's really when we see symptoms of that really severe fatigue. It's like hard to wake up in the morning. It's hard to really get through your day at all. Um, a lot of people complain that they need a midday nap. Uh, they're really tired all day, but then they can't sleep at night either. And so a lot of times 
they can't stay asleep because of blood sugar irregularities, just because of the high cortisol. Um, or sometimes they can sleep, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours, and then they wake up and they're just still really tired. So, you know, cortisol is usually lower um, as we head into exhaustion. So we also see, you know, inflammatory and autoimmune diseases set in uh, and they can get, patients can get irregular menstrual cycles. Um, because their adrenal glands just aren't working to properly um, regulate that HPA axis. Signaling just isn't working anymore uh, because of that high cortisol, and then we just get kind of dysfunction downstream. So here's a look at the central nervous system, the parasympathetic and uh, sympathetic nervous systems. And when we're talking about that alarm stage, remember in that person, the parasympathetic should activate and balance that sympathetic um, dominance. And so when we get that, you know, cut off in traffic, spike of adrenaline or epinephrine, and it kicks in to dilate our pupils, it inhibits digestion, relaxes bronchi and increases our heart rate. Um, it also stimulates the release of glucose from our liver so that we have sugar in our blood ready to be burned for energy. All of these things that happen in response to that sympathetic stimulation really get us, you know, ready for the fight. And we need that parasympathetic nervous system to kick in um, after that initial stressor so that our systems can return to homeostasis. So in practice, um, I frequently see patients that are stuck in that sympathetic dominance and they have just had so many continual stressors that their body is just stuck in emergency mode and they can't even engage their parasympathetic nervous system to balance them. Uh, just by sitting across from them, you know, I can easily identify um, that they have these symptoms going on. You know, these are the patients that never slow down. They're just kind of go, go, go. You can see that, you know, when they're sitting in front of you, their shoulders seem really tense and they're talking really fast. And, you know, they've just got a million things. They don't even really have time for your office visit. Uh, when you're talking about working out, you know, they love to work out. They want to run a marathon. They want to, you know, just go really heavy in the gym and they think yoga or deep breathing are just, you know, really boring or maybe even kind of corny. And, you know, generally they also have digestive complaints. And that's because remember, you know, they're going to have decreased blood flow to digestive organs. So they don't really get proper hydrochloric acid production, peristalsis or gallbladder function. Um, they many times can't sleep because they're just constantly, you know, releasing epinephrine, which is triggering cortisol release. And, you know, remember cortisol should be highest first thing in the morning and then lowest at night when we're sleeping. And so if they're triggering cortisol or adrenaline release all day, um, they're going to have a hard time falling asleep at night and then they're going to be pretty anxious. And these people, you know, they feel on edge all the time. Maybe they're snappy or irritable. Um, their nervous systems are just kind of frazzled. And so that's what I see with the sympathetic dominant patient. Um, it's pretty obvious. We want to increase the parasympathetic tone in these patients. So if you remember, you know, acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system, and it's responsible for that rest and digest function. So what acetylcholine does is help to contract smooth muscles, dilate blood vessels, decrease your heart rate, um, increase bodily secretions like saliva and HCL, you know, all of those, um, all of these you can see are going to help lower blood pressure, lower anxiety, and improve digestion in that sympathetic dominant patient. So we've got a case study here that I want to talk about. This is a patient that I've seen in my office recently, and I thought it was a good representation of a lot of patients I've been seeing recently, so I thought it would make a great case. So here we have um, a 35-year-old female that presents to the clinic with a new onset of insomnia and anxiety. She's a mother of three elementary age kids, and she just started unplanned homeschooling. I can relate. Um, now there's no time for exercise or meal planning. Even, uh, you know, meals are rushed or skipped altogether. Usually she drinks coffee and snacks on candy until dinner. She's constipated. She says she has one sluggish bowel movement every two to three days. 
Uh, she also has bouts of increased heart rate and chest pressure that come and go. She feels on edge, short-tempered with her kids. She lies in bed several hours at night before finally falling asleep. Uh, she says that her energy generally is okay, but she feels mentally exhausted. Okay, so all of the parents that kind of got shoved into homeschooling can probably identify with this. Uh, a little bit higher anxiety, and then your whole t routine is off also. So you're trying to figure out how to manage your nervous system and kind of get things back to normal function, but like the stress just keeps coming. You know, there's just more hurdles that, that keep coming. I listed the symptoms of sympathetic dominance here, and I've checked the boxes that apply to this patient. So obviously with her, we see anxiety. Um, she didn't have high blood pressure, but that would be a sign. Uh, decreased appetite, remember your sympathetic nervous system is not supportive of digestion. And so a lot of times we see a decreased appetite because of the decreased HCL production. And then obviously, uh, constipation would follow that downstream. Um, she did not report sensitivity to light, um, but we see that because of the pupillary re reaction um, that's going on with stress, and we'll talk about that here coming up. Um, insomnia, sugar cravings. A lot of times insomnia can be due to elevated cortisol, or it can also be due to just the blood sugar imbalance. And um, those two can sometimes go together even. A lot of times we do see fatigue, uh, feeling cold, again, because of just blood supply, not shunting to where it's supposed to. And then water retention is another common symptom of sympathetic dominance. In my office, I like uh, to use functional evaluations to help identify where a patient's at. And I think it really helps with compliance uh, because they can see that we're looking deeper than their medical doctor. And these are also things that we can you know, measure again and again at each office visit to monitor improvement. And whether they think they're feeling better or not, sometimes it's really hard to tell because, you know, stress and anxiety, um, those situations can be so changeable. Um, but we can look back at these functional evaluations over time and really see if they're in fact improving or not. So salivary pH is one that I love just because it's cheap and easy and fast. Uh, you can just get some pH paper. Uh, you want it to range from 6.0 to 8.0. The ideal um, is going to be a 7.2 is where you want your patient to register. And you just um, give the patient a tip or a strip of the pH paper and have them saturate that uh, with their saliva. And then you just measure the color along the bottom to see what number they are. So if it's too low, down in like the 6.0, 6.4 range, that's going to be an obvious, obvious sympathetic dominance case. Um, and they're going to be stuck in that anaerobic metabolism, burning sugar for energy. And we can see that, you know, in their pH number here. And then if it's too high, that's the parasympathetic dominance. Uh, they're going to be more around that dark blue color at the eight range, but that's pretty rare to see. Um, we generally see patients that are hovering between 6.0 and 4.0 when they're complaining of stress and anxiety. And then at each visit, we just recheck and we want them again to kind of get closer to that 7.2 number to make sure, um, yeah, that they're getting improvement. Also make sure the patient isn't chewing gum at the visit because that can um, also impact the results. Another functional evaluation that I like to do is the pupillary response test. So this one requires a dark room. Uh, if you remember this one from school, you enter a dark room and then you shine the light into the patient's pupil. And so the pupil should constrict in response to the light and then it should remain constricted until the light's taken away. Um, it's epinephrine that excites the muscles surrounding the iris of the eye. And so uh, that dilates the pupil when you're in sympathetic dominance. And so if there isn't enough parasympathetic tone in the system, the pupil won't be able to remain constricted when the light's shined into the eye and actually will just immediately constrict because of the light. And then um, it will quickly like vacillate back open into dilation. So this isn't something I do really frequently in my office uh, just because I don't have a dark room. But sometimes I have patients do it at home and report back. But another really quick measure is just to ask them if their eyes become more sensitive to light. You know, if they're always having to wear sunglasses, then obviously their pupils aren't staying constricted in the presence of light. And so you can, you know, 
kind of think that this might be part of the case for them. And then the next functional exam that I do with all my patients uh, is postural hypotension. And you may have heard of Raglan sign or um, orthostatic hypotension. This is a more you know, user-friendly version of those. Instead of having your patient supine to standing, uh, which is what you do with the orthostatic hypotension, I just record their blood pressure seated to standing, uh, just because it's easier to perform in my office and I still get a lot of great information from it. Um, so what we're looking for here is an increase in the systolic pressure from seated position to standing position. If there's any amount of increase in the systolic pressure, the patient's doing great. So um, if it stays the same or drops down, that's when we're definitely looking at some level of adrenal fatigue. Um, and that's what we would call a positive result. And that's happening here because, you know, that norepinephrine that's responsible for constricting blood vessels in response to gravity when we stand up. Um, and so it's seen near the exhaustion phase when like the epinephrine and the norepinephrine are more depleted in the body, uh, the normal response like no longer happening. So it allows their blood pressure to just fall going from seated to standing. And that is obviously showing us, you know, later resistance phase into the exhaustion phase of that general adaptation syndrome. So be careful on this one though, because many patients get dizzy. Um, oh, and clinical pearl. Um, when we do see a positive on this test, especially if the patient is getting dizzy, licorice in combination with adrenal glandulars really work well to kind of correct the blood pressure, pressure and decrease that feeling of dizziness for patients. Um, so think about that because it can actually be dangerous if they're, you know, getting dizzy and passing out when they go from seated to standing. Okay, so let's go back to our case study. We did these functional evaluations for our stressed out mama patient and her salivary pH was a 6.2. That definitely is sympathetic dominance, right? And then the pupillary response was positive when I had her do it at home. Um, she said that her pupil constricted and then it just kind of vacillated right back open. And then her postural hypotension was negative in office. She had kind of low-ish blood pressure, uh, 110 over 68, really not too bad. And then when she stood up, uh, it did increase to 114 over 70. So to me, that shows that maybe she's not quite in that exhaustion phase. She's either in the alarm or resistance phase of adrenal exhaustion. And then I do muscle testing in my practice, which if you don't, I think you should, it's awesome. Um, but I do it because it really helps to narrow your treatment plans and make them more effective. Um, but with her, she did test have, uh, she tested positive reflex points over the adrenal, stomach and liver reflexes. And that just indicates stress in those organs. So when you think about it, you know, decreased stomach acid production, uh, because of sympathetic dominance or stress can contribute to constipation and then constipation can contribute to liver toxicity. And so to me, that's really how her adrenal stomach and liver are really all tied together. And we know that everything is connected. So um, I just think it's really cool when the dots get connected like that. So treatment options. Uh, the point of today's lecture, you know, is to understand how to treat that alarm and early resistance phase patient. They're stuck in that fight or flight. And we really need to support that parasympathetic tone. Uh, so I wanted to first help you identify that state in your patients. Um, we want it, you know, to decide where they are in that general adaptation syndrome uh, so we can give them the most effective treatments. And so here's just a couple tips on how to do that. So like I said, we've already identified our patient to be in the alarm or early resistance phase. Um, she had that initial stressor um, of having to unexpectedly homeschool her kids. And, you know, I can imagine all the acute stressors that come along with that, uh, not to mention the changes in, you know, her diet and movement or lack of movement uh, in her body that, you know, makes her body also perceive those as stress. The continual release of epinephrine, you know, can decrease her salivary pH, and she did have a low salivary pH at 6.2. Um, positive pupillary response, that's going to be the alarm or early resistance phase. Sugar craving 
things to remember, our patient said that she was drinking coffee and eating sugar all day until dinner. Um, so that's the alarm early resistance because uh, the cortisol is elevated, which is going to increase sugar breakdown from the liver, and that causes spikes, you know, which just increase those sugar cravings. And then patients that can't sleep, we usually think uh, about the alarm or early resistance phase is also uh, because of those um, high cortisol levels and that blood sugar instability. Uh, we see positive postural hypotension that usually shows late resistance um, or exhaustion phase uh, just because of the depletion of norepinephrine. Um, salt cravings are also seen in the late resistance exhaustion phase because of the decreased cortisol. And then if you can't sleep at all, that high anxiety, can't turn your brain off type, uh, we see that really in the alarm or early resistance phase. If they want to sleep all day because they're just so tired and wiped out, we see that in the exhaustion phase. So those are just a couple key features um, that you can look at to help identify where your patients are. Okay, so treatments for our patient. So here's some options. So let's start with nutrition. Um, um, nutrition helps to support, that can help support the parasympathetic nervous system. You know, here are just a few nutrients and where we can find them in food. Obviously, we know um, that when a patient is really stuck, concentrated nutrients in supplements um, are going to be way more powerful than just having them eat more of certain foods. Um, and I mean concentrated nutrients still from food so that we can enhance the bioavailability and increase the absorption of all of the things that we're asking our patients to take. This is why I really prefer the whole food supplementation over synthetic forms. So choline, obviously this is the precursor to making acetylcholine, um, that neurotransmitter that is, you know, predominantly active in the parasympathetic nervous system. So choline you can get from eggs, meat, fish. Um, I was taught that taking choline supplements is like the brake pedal to your nervous system when you're kind of going 100 miles an hour. So you can think of it that way. And inositol is in the B vitamin family, and we can get that from liver, citrus fruit, legumes, and molasses, uh, but it's also made in the body. And it's kind of shown not only to decrease anxiety, but also to help stabilize blood sugar. So that really helps when patients can fall asleep, uh, but they wake up all night and they can't stay asleep. Uh, so that's usually a blood sugar issue and inositol at bedtime can really help with that. All of these B vitamins are ones that are kind of relaxing to the nervous system and not so stimulating. So we've got here B2, B3, B6, and the various places we can find them in food, um, but they help with vasodilation. Magnesium is always really important for calming down the nervous system. And of course, I prefer whole food versions that contain multi-forms of magnesium. Um, so you get a higher absorption rate without the bowel irritation that you can get with some of the synthetic varieties. Um, and then we also have here essential fatty acids. And we do see these nutrients playing a role in the synthesis um, or the maintenance of acetylcholine in the body. So that's how they're helping. Now, there are many um, herbs that can really be supportive uh, with anxiety and sympathetic dominance. So I just chose a few of my faves. Um, this is my most favorite, ashwagandha or withania. And this herb I remember from school with the signature of uh, for patients that feel tired but wired. Um, it's great for those patients that are really have that go, go, go kind of energy about them. Uh, they're really wired, but they also complain that they're tired at the same time. Uh, and so that definitely reminds me of our patient. Um, ashwagandha is a sedative, a hypotensive adaptogen, and it really helps to relieve nervous tension and anxiety while also kind of boosting energy. So definitely think of ashwagandha for that tired and wired patient. It's one of my favorites and I've been using a lot more lately. And then licorice is an adrenal modulator, uh, spasmolytic, a mild laxative. It helps to relieve exhaustion related to adrenal stress. It also relaxes smooth muscles and helps to restore normal digestive function. So this can be really helpful in a patient like ours who's constipated because they're in sympathetic dominance um, and their digestion is inhibited.
Some other herbs that we have to help the parasympathetic tone in the body, um, skullcap, great for insomnia, especially those with restless sleep due to anxiety. Um, it's a sedative, an antispasmodic, and a hypotensive, and it helps to relieve, you know, restless sleep. And so um, it also helps with uh, relieving heart palpitations, anxiety, also restores a depleted nervous system. That would possibly be a good choice um, for our patient, maybe in addition to the ashwagandha. Another herb, kava, is a sedative, hypnotic, and an anesthetic, and it helps to relieve anxiety, stress, muscle tension, and insomnia. I use this one a lot for patients that really want to reach for that glass of wine to chill out at night. Um, I get them just to take two to three kava instead, and they get that same kind of chilled out, relaxed feeling without the sugar and alcohol, so it's really a win-win. Um, and then lemon balm or melissa. This is another one of my favorites. It's a nervine sedative and antidepressant. It does help to relieve anxiety, restlessness, palpitations, and irritability. Um, I really like this one sometimes to put in like a spray bottle or a dropper bottle for patients. I mix it with a little bit of elderberry. And especially when they're complaining, you know, that they're feeling on edge or just super irritable, just a couple of squirts in the mouth can really take the edge off. And then it tastes pretty good too. It's kind of like a lemon berry pie or something, um, but it really kind of helps to reset the nervous system and just calm them down in the moment. So that's a trick I use pretty frequently. Dietary support of the parasympathetic nervous system is really all about blood sugar stabilization. So remember that high epinephrine and cortisol, those are going to be making our blood sugars kind of wonky. And so protein is the best way to stable, stabilize blood sugar. You really want half your body weight in grams of protein daily. So an example, if you weigh 140 pounds, uh, that's going to be about 70 grams of protein a day. So animal protein is best in terms of blood sugar stabilization, but you can also think of adding in things like nuts, hard boiled eggs, um, or even like whole food protein shakes. Um, it's really not that hard to get enough protein, but I think it is something that you actually need to take a look at, you know, looking at your diet just to see where you are and where you can add more. I also encourage patients to be snacking every three hours when they're in that um, early phase. And so again, protein is best, but I tell them they don't need to be eating a meal every three hours, but they need to be taking a bite of something just to help stabilize their blood sugar. It's really important in that early resistance phase, and it can really help prevent things from escalating at a more rapid rate. So, and then just decreasing sugar consumption altogether. Obviously, that's going to help stabilize blood sugar. So, uh, sometimes I have patients even come off of eating fruit at the beginning, because as long as they're craving sweets, they really try to replace the sugar, you know, with fruit or other sugar alternatives. Um, and as long as they're doing that, they're going to continue craving it. And so, just having them cut back on the sugar and increase their protein for about a week um, usually decreases those sugar cravings pretty quick. Okay, what about lifestyle supports uh, that we can do for the parasympathetic nervous system? Deep breathing, probably one of the most beneficial, uh, but with these patients that have high anxiety, um, and they're your go, go, go patients, it's going to get be really hard to get them to chill out and actually implement this. Um, so I try to use a tool called habit stacking. Uh, this is to just help establish new habits on top of existing behaviors. And so just think of that patient, you know, what they might be doing several times a day. Um, a couple examples are like filling your water glass, going to the bathroom, or maybe, you know, starting your car several times a day. So I ask them just to stack deep breathing on top of one of those existing behaviors that are already in place. And so every time you sit on the toilet, you're just gonna automatically take 10 deep breaths in and out. Or every time you turn on your car, you automatically take 10 deep breaths in and out. And you know, if they do this every time, it can become a habit and then it's just tagged on top of that previous behavior that they were already doing. And so then they don't have to like set reminders on their phone um, or things like that. 
um, because they're already doing those behaviors several times a day. So, you know, if they're successful, now they're going to be doing deep breathing several times a day. And um, I do find that deep breathing helps a ton to reset the nervous system, but only when a patient is actually doing it. So I recommend three times a day, and it doesn't really have to be for long, uh, just maybe 10 deep breaths in and out three times a day to remind your nervous system that, you know, it's not being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. So um, infrared saunas are an awesome way to increase parasympathetic tone also. We have one at our office and we encourage our patients to use it all the time. Um, but there's also several at-home varieties that patients can look into, but saunas are great. They're really helpful for detoxification, inflammation, vasodilating, and relaxation. And exercise. So remember that sympathetic dominant patient, they're going to be wanting to do really strenuous exercise. Um, and we need to encourage their nervous systems to chill out. And so we're going to want to have them do the exercise that they really don't want to do. So um, we're going to encourage like stretching and breathing, yoga, Pilates, maybe going for like a brisk walk. You know, I encourage patients not to do any long distance running uh, just because it will deplete them more than it will restore them. So just think about that cup analogy. Uh, they have to be kind of in a place of health to really get the benefit from that type of exercise. And then a gratitude journal. This is an awesome way just to get your nervous system balanced and increase that parasympathetic tone. So I encourage that. And then sleep. Obviously sleep can be a problem um, in contributing to anxiety in the first place. But we want patients to be allowing for a minimum of seven hours a night. And sometimes patients just aren't even allowing for that much sleep. And so it's something that really needs to be corrected. They need to make time in their schedules to be getting a minimum of seven hours of sleep. So really seven to nine hours is what we're shooting for. Um, and then we can work on restoring the quality of sleep. But, you know, if they're not even making time in their day to sleep seven hours, obviously they're not going to be able to get it at all. With this particular patient, I gave her um, hydrochloric acid to be taken with meals, and that was just to help restore digestion and nutrient absorption. Um, I like to start at the top with HCL because it triggers a response downstream to restore kind of the rest of the digestive tract. Um, then I gave her a supplement that contained actually a lot of the things that we already talked about. Um, it had B1, B3, B6, choline, and, and inositol all in a combination. And those all, you know, were targeted at calming her nervous system and support production of acetylcholine uh, to provide that vasodilating effect for her. And then we gave her ashwagandha, tired but wired, right? Um, and I told her to do deep breathing exercises three times a day and then asked her to eat a protein snack every three hours. And so when we saw her back in our, at our four week follow-up, she reported increased sleep, energy, and less anxiety. She said there were no more heart palpitations or chest pressure, although she did still have some high stress, which is understandable. Um, we can't take people's stress away, but the goal is to help them manage it better, right? Um, she felt like she was more patient with her kids. Her bowel movements had improved. Uh, she said she was having a bowel movement most days now, not quite every day, but that's definitely an improvement. And then her diet could also still use some improvement, but her sugar cravings were greatly decreased. Um, I think that's a win for a four-week follow-up, and we can just kind of continue to tweak her treatment plan to improve her symptom picture even more. And remember, like to identify where the patient is and the stages of the general adaptation syndrome first uh, so that we can kind of help pinpoint your treatment plan and make sure you're going in the right direction. Also, utilize some of these, you know, therapies to help support the tone of the parasympathetic nervous system, to help relieve anxiety and just that nervous tension overall. Um, and this can help you know, your patients get back on track, restore adrenal function, uh, and just prevent progression towards adrenal exhaustion, which is the ultimate goal. So that's all I've got for you. And thanks for joining. I hope you were able to take away something that will help you better serve your next patient.